I am so uh, pleased uh, to have the chance to introduce our guest speaker, Professor Aviva Chomsky. Uh, before that, I want to uh, thank the College of uh, Arts and Science and the Division of Humanities for its support of uh, the dynamic exchange of ideas and uh, the culture of, of inquiry. We in, in the Division of Humanities also want to thank Professor Aviva Chomsky uh, for her very generous uh, visit. A uh, few um, hours ago, we did a great uh, interview in Spanish, and uh, her Spanish is uh, beautiful, <laughs> um, by the way. Um, Aviva Chomsky is a prolific American historian, author, and activist. She currently teaches at Salem State College uh, in Massachusetts, where she is uh, also the coordinator of the Latin American uh, Studies Program. Uh, she previously was a uh, research associ associate at uh, Harvard University, where she specialized in Caribbean and Latin American history. Her book, West Indian Work, uh, Workers and the United Fruit Company in uh, Costa Rica, 1817-1940, uh, was awarded the, awarded the 1997 Best Book Prize by uh, the New, New England Council of Latin American Studies. She's also the author of many other books like uh, Linked uh, Labor Stories, Histories, uh, New uh, England, uh, Colombia, and the Making of a Global Working Class, uh, published by Duke University, uh, Duke University Press in 19, uh, 2008, sorry. And uh, her uh, latest two books are, um, they take our jobs uh, and 20 other myths about immigration, that this one was published in uh, two, uh, 2007, and uh, uh, undocumented, how immigration became illegal. It was published in uh, 2014. And I really recommend both uh, of them. Um, Professor Chomsky is uh, currently working on an uh, anthology on the state of labor in Boston, uh, looking at the different working classes of Boston and how they and they, their organizations have fared in the past quarter century since Boston's supposed uh, revival. Professor Chomsky is uh, also working on a research project on settler colonialism, uh, the working class history, and the carceral states. Uh, and just to close uh, this br very brief introduction, I would like to read a quote uh, by French novelist Anatole France that, was, uh, that remark was made uh, as 100 uh, years ago, uh, which is included in some of those in this book, I think, and I, I consider it a kind of a gem because uh, it's bright from different point of view. And Anatole, Anatole friend said, in its majestic equality, the law forbid, forbids rich and poor alike to sleep under bridges, beg in the street, and steal loaves of bread. So without any further ado, uh, it's my pleasure an honor to introduce uh, our guest to, um, to you this uh, evening, Professor Aviva Chomsky. I'm addicted to my technology, so I have to be close to my computer. I can't step away from it to talk. <laughs> Um, thank you, Jorge, for the lovely introduction. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And thanks um, to Jorge and all of the other people who are um, helped to bring me here to your beautiful campus and your beautiful weather. Um, it's really nice to be here. And thank you all for, for coming to hear me. So what I'm going to talk about tonight is a kind of a combination of some things that I've been working on for a really long time and some things that I'm in the midst of working on right now, especially about settler colonialism and the carceral state and labor. I'm still trying to figure out the relationship among the three. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna be referring to those tonight and hopefully by the end of the lecture I'll have it figured out because I'm trying to write an article about it and I can tell I have like all the pieces there but I haven't quite figured out what it all adds up to yet. So I thought I would try to incorporate some of that in my talk tonight and, and hopefully help work through it. Um, we're a nice small group. 
I can talk for hours nonstop, but I would love to make this more interactive too. So if anybody has a question, a point of confusion, you should feel absolutely free to interrupt me. And I will try to limit myself to, say, 40 minutes of speaking so that we can have time for some uh, organized interaction. But don't hesitate to stop me along the way either, because um, it will not distract me. It'll make me happy, because I'll know you're listening. So the title of my talk tonight is Criminalization, Immigration, and Citizenship in the 21st Century. Um, I'm a historian. So in order to talk about the 21st century, am I holding this the right distance from my mouth, by the way? Can you all hear me right? OK. OK. Um, so in order to talk about these three issues in the 21st century, my approach is always to say, well, we have to look at the roots. And my approach to history is often to say, what we've been taught about history all our lives is wrong. and I want to reframe the way we think about the history of immigration, citizenship, and criminalization in this country. So that's what a lot of my work has been devoted to and continues to be devoted to doing. So let me just pause on each of these concepts for a moment. Um, criminalization and this concept of the carceral state, which we were discussing earlier, I didn't know how to say it in Spanish, so now I know how to say it in Spanish. Um, but uh, the carceral state, uh, it's a phrase that's thrown around all over the place in the literature these days. Um, and so I wanted to think about what does all this new work that's being done on the carceral state have to do with my work on the history of immigration and labor? I know it has something to do with it. What do we mean by the carceral state? We're talking about the state to mean the government, so in this case the government of the United States, um, that has increasingly at the end of the 20th and into the 21st century taken on as one of its major tasks incarcerating, that is putting, arresting, detaining, putting into jail and deporting large numbers of people in the United States, in particular large and disproportionate numbers of people of color in the United States. So the carceral state is held up in contrast to, say, the social welfare state. The social welfare state is a state, a government, that is, aims at providing for the social welfare of the people who live in that state. And I mean, I'm using state in its like political science term, not like the state of Florida, but like the government of the country. Um, the carceral state, has increasingly replaced the social welfare state in the United States so that fewer and fewer resources are being spent on things like public education and uh, uh, health care and infrastructure. And more and more resources are spent on incarceration. So we built up this huge infrastructure of prisons, of militarized police. Um, uh, and of detention and deportation of immigrants. These are happening simultaneously uh, since, I would say, the last quarter of the 20th century and into the 21st century. So criminalization in the carceral state in general and, uh, and in particular criminalization and incarceration and deportation of immigrants. Um, So, I want to start out by talking about, um, as I said, my goal is to rewrite history, but I want to begin by uh, going over the history that I learned in graduate school when I took a course on immigration history. Um, what I know some of my colleagues are still teaching when they teach immigration history. Um, what many of you may have learned 
whether you took a course on immigration history, hopefully you learned it differently if you took a course, but even if you didn't take a course, I'm guessing probably 95% of you have not taken a course on immigration history, but I'm guessing that you have heard this master narrative even if you have never taken that course. And that's why we call it a master narrative. It's a narrative that controls our brains. From the day we enter the United States, either by being born or by coming into the country, and perhaps even before we come into the country, if we lived somewhere else, this narrative is, is, is taking over our brain and controlling the way we think. So, so I want to articulate this narrative. Um, you see it in the news media, you see it in popular media, I'm sure you see it in social media, which you guys probably look at a lot more than I do. Um, you breathe it in with the, with the air you breathe every day. Okay, so I wanna go over this master narrative and I hope you'll be nodding and telling me that it's kind of familiar. So the narrative of immigration history divides it, uh, our immigration history into four periods and it begins with the assumption that this is a country of immigrants. How many people of you have heard that phrase? Okay, so even if you haven't taken the course, you've heard the phrase, this is a country of immigrants. I see some people still raising their hands late. Um, so I think that that is a problematic statement and that that problematic assumption permeates the master narrative. So I'm, I give you some hints at the bottom of this slide as to what I think is wrong with the master narrative. Um, I think there's three areas that we need to keep in mind as we're critiquing the master narrative. Uh, one is race, one is geography, and one is labor. So I'm giving you some hints as I go along to help you critique what I think you've heard before and probably uh, haven't thought deeply about how to critique before, but we're gonna work through it. So, we begin the story of the immigrant history of the United States um, in the early 1600s, and the master narrative goes something like this. Uh, immigrants came from England. We know some things about these immigrants. They came from a country called England, and they spoke a language called English. Um, they came in mostly in small family groups, preparing to settle in the United States. They started little farms and they founded little villages and they set up some kind of rudimentary town councils and governments and charters to govern themselves. They produced what they consumed. Um, they farmed, they had maybe a baker, maybe a tailor, maybe a, a person who made horseshoes, um, they milked their cows, they made their cheese, um, and they were the first immigrants and uh, set the basis for this being a country of immigrants. Has everybody heard that narrative? Okay, so what's wrong with it? Okay. Okay, so it's kind of projecting backward laws and categories that were invented over the course of the 19th century and the 20th century to this idea we hold in our head that we know what an immigrant is. So let me just pause for a minute. What is an immigrant? Um, I'll give you a 
quick definition. An immigrant is somebody who moves across a national border to a new country with the intention of staying. So you were talking about different kinds of visas. Um, under the US legal system, there are numerous different ways a person can legally enter the country, but only one of them is as an immigrant. If you enter as a student, if you enter as a temporary worker, if you enter as a tourist, you do not get an immigrant visa. You only get an immigrant visa if you get permission to come and stay permanently. Um, so, so, okay, uh, so we're taking a series of meanings and laws that develop over a long period of time and projecting them backwards. What else is wrong with um, the way I, I presented the picture, especially from the perspective of race, geography, and labor? Yes. It didn't mention any Native Americans, okay? So there's a fundamental flaw with calling this a country of immigrants, with celebrating the idea that this is a country of immigrants. And the fundamental flaw is a second term in my new research project, which is settler colonialism. Settler colonialism is a kind of colonialism, a kind of colonization, which is predicated on this idea of eliminating and replacing the native population. Not all colonialism does that. If you look at European colonialism in Africa, for example, the idea wasn't to eliminate the native population. The idea was to rule over and exploit the labor of the native population. But there were certain examples, especially by the British, in America, in Australia, um, where their goal was actually the goal of elimination, of creating a white country. And that required the elimination of non-white peoples who lived in the area. So there's something deeply racially inflected about the statement that we are a country of immigrants and about telling the story of the country beginning with English people coming to the country. What else? Yeah. Okay, so we haven't even gotten to the Founding Fathers yet, but you point up another racial problem with this narrative. That is, this narrative defines the old immigrants as English people. Um, that does not cover all of the people who came to the United States during the 1600s and 1700s. It erases not only the Native Americans, it also erases the Africans who were brought to the country. Now, one could say, well, they weren't immigrants because they didn't come voluntarily, and that would also be true, but that just compounds the problem of telling the history of the United States by saying this is a country of immigrants, because there's a subtext to saying this is a country of immigrants that is to say, this is a country that tells its history as a history of white people. Oh, we're going to get to today. Like 
So we're going to get to today. <laughs> um, OK. So the second uh, period of immigration history um, is called the New Immigrants. Um, this period begins in the 1800s when, so goes the master narrative, the character of immigrants changed. There were new waves of immigration coming into the United States, but they were no longer English people. The immigrants who came in the 19th century were, came from French Canada, they came from Ireland, they came from Southern Europe, they came from Eastern Europe. Um, the old immigrants spoke English, but the new immigrants did not speak English. They spoke a whole lot of other languages. Um, the old immigrants were Protestant. Yes. OK, so you are telling us something that was wrong with our master narrative from the perspective of geography. That is, the, the, if we want to tell the history that I started telling, the master narrative of history, starts from the eastern coast of the United States. It makes a decision. The history of the United States starts in the east, the northeast, in fact. But if we make a different decision, if we're, we say the history of the United States starts in the South, or the history of the United States starts in the West, then we're telling a very different story in which the English are not the first, the old immigrants. The Spanish are here way before the English are here, if we're, even if we're talking about Europeans. So, so geography is also, and these problems are interlinked, race, geography, and labor. Um, since we just went back and talked about geography, can anybody say what's wrong with the old immigrant narrative from the perspective of labor? We kind of touched on it, but we didn't, we didn't quite articulate it. Yes? Okay, yes, that there's this story about white English people producing what they consume, but that's not, that's only a tiny piece of the story of labor. Um, in this period of the 1600s, 1700s, and early 1800s. A much bigger piece of the period of labor, of the story of labor, is enslaved African labor. Okay, so race, geography, and labor all kind of tying in together. Back to the new immigrants period. Um, so from the perspective of geography, oh, so the immigrants come from the peripheries of Europe, they're no longer Protestant. They might be Catholic, they might be Jewish, they might be Orthodox, um, but they're not Protestant like those old immigrants supposedly were. Um, and according to the narrative, they come to Ellis Island, they come to New York, they're welcomed by the Statue of Liberty holding up her torch saying, give us your tired, your poor, um, they're processed, they're welcomed, they're brought into the country, and they go to work in factories. They come during the Industrial Revolution, and they come to labor as the new working class in the factories. So what's wrong with this piece of the narrative? Ever, has everyone heard that piece of the narrative too? In bits and pieces at least? Okay, so what's wrong there? Think race, geography, and labor. Were those Europeans the only people coming to the United States at this time? Sorry? OK, this narrative leaves out the Chinese. OK? And this is connected to race, geography, and labor. 
in that the Chinese did not come to Ellis Island. They came to Angel Island. They didn't come to the East Coast. They came to the West Coast. They didn't go to work in all those factories. What kind of work did the Chinese do? Hmm? Railroads, yes. Um, so race, geography, and labor. Um, who else is left out of this narrative? Who else is coming to the United States in the 19th century, early 20th century? There were some people coming from India who followed more along the pattern of the Chinese, that is more in the West. But one other large group of people. Again, uh, the Russians mostly followed the pattern of, of the East Coast. No, I think the Italians fit right smack into that narrative of the new immigrants coming from the peripheries of Europe. You guys are missing the most obvious. Mexicans, Mexicans, okay? Race, geography, and labor. Where are the Mexicans coming? They're not coming to Ellis Island. They're not coming to Angel Island. They're coming from the south. And what kind of labor are they doing? Um, by the 20th century, they're moving into farm labor. Uh, beginning in the 19th century, it's more mining and also railroad labor. But it's not the typical factory story that we hear when we tell the story from the perspective of the East Coast and from the perspective of European immigrants. Um, and just keep this word immigrant and what it means in your head, because we're going to go into it a lot more in a few, couple of minutes. Okay, so according to this master narrative, in 1924, this open, welcoming system towards immigrants, the door closes, 1921, 1924. In 1921, 1924, Congress implements quotas, racial quotas, limiting the numbers of these new immigrants. The descendants of the old immigrants, who are the ones who control the Congress, who are the ones who control the courts, who are the ones who control the executive, um, say, this is getting a little out of hand, all these people who don't speak English, all these people who aren't Protestant, all these people who aren't quite white enough, even though they're white. Um, we want to get the correct racial balance back, and that was what we had before all these immigrants come. So we're going to cut way down on all those Russians, all those Italians, um, and open the doors only to the English, basically. Um, so we have this period in the middle of the 20th century, 1924 to 1965, which in the master narrative is presented as the period of restrictions, immigration restrictions. Then in 1965, we have a new immigration law which gets rid of all the racial restrictions, which gets rid of all the discrimination, and which opens the doors again and makes us a welcoming country to everyone in the world again. So that's the master narrative. Um, I've given you some clues as to what's wrong with it, um, but I'm going to go into a lot more depth now. Um, and I want to start by just thinking about this term immigrant and what it means to be an immigrant or to be a country that celebrates immigration um, in a land that belongs to native people and what we do do to ourselves when we rewrite this history. Um, when the United States is founded, it celebrates this idea of immigration, this idea that it's a country founded by immigrants, this idea that immigrants are welcome, that we want more immigrants. 
um, right there in the Declaration of Independence. And they also make it really clear that the purpose of immigration, that is the purpose of bringing white Europeans to the United States, is settler colonialism. It is the elimination and replacement of the native population. So you can say, yes, we are a country of immigrants, but it's not exactly something that should be celebrated as showing how welcoming and multicultural the history of this country is. On the contrary, it should be seen as showing how racist the history of this country is. Um, so the Declaration of Independence begins by saying that the history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having a direct object, the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. Um, and then it goes on with a series of bullet points, which probably weren't called bullet points back then, uh, that, that list all the things that the king has done that, uh, that require these white English people to declare their independence. Um, he has endeavored to prevent the population of these states. This is the king they're referring to. That is, the king is limiting immigration. That's why we need independence, because we need more immigrants. For that purpose, obstructing the laws for the naturalization of foreigners. That is, the colonists want more immigration. They want it to be easier to immigrate because their project is a racial project of replacement. Refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither, that is, foreigners, we need more foreigners, and raising the conditions of new appropriations of lands. What does that last piece mean? What is the king doing when he is raising the conditions of new appropriations of lands? That means he's making it more difficult for us to take more native land. And what they are specifically referring to here is, uh, is a law passed in 1763 by which the king uh, stated, drew a line um, saying that white settlement was not allowed beyond the Appalachian Mountains. So the British Crown was actually trying to limit and restrict white settlement, trying to slow down immigration, and trying to stop the taking of native lands. And that was one of the major reasons for the American Revolution. Let me just pause to say something else about the American Revolution. We call it a revolution, right? Has everybody heard it called a revolution? Many historians today argue that it was not a revolution at all. The American Revolution was totally different from every other anti-colonial revolution that has taken place since then, and there have been many. To understand why the American Revolution was not a revolution, certainly not an anti-colonial revolution, it helps to look at it in comparison with the Haitian Revolution the next American revolution, the Haitian revolution, which actually is an anti-colonial revolution. In the case of Haiti, as in the case of virtually every other anti-colonial revolution, the revolution is carried out by the people who have been colonized. And it's carried out against the colonizers. That's why it's called anti-colonial. In the case of the Haitian Revolution, this means it was carried out by enslaved Africans and their descendants in Haiti, and it was carried out against the French colonizers of Haiti. The French were actually thrown out of Haiti during the Haitian Revolution, and a new country run by the formerly colonized people was founded. The American Revolution was exactly the opposite. The American Revolution was not carried out by Native Americans. It was not carried out by African Americans. It was carried out by white colonizers. And their 
goal was not to end European colonialism, it was to advance European colonialism. It was to escape from the restrictions that the British crown had placed on colonialism. That is on immigration and the appropriation of native lands. Thus we see in the Declaration of Independence um, that in fact these colonizers want freedom to colonize more. That is what the American Revolution is about, the so-called American Revolution. Does everybody follow this? Yes. Oh, that's coming, that's coming. You're, you're, just, you're just getting ahead of me. Um, so one of the first things that Congress did um, was to legislate citizenship. Who can belong to this new country? In legislating citizenship, they are also legislating immigration. That is, if an immigrant is somebody who's coming to stay, who someone, is someone who's coming to join the polity, only people who are able to become citizens are able to be immigrants. Other people may be here, but there's a line drawn around the country. The country belongs to the people who can be citizens. Other people are not immigrants because they can't belong to the country. And this line is a racial line. So the first naturalization rule, remember they were complaining because the king was making it too hard to naturalize. So they make it really easy to naturalize if you are white. Be it enacted by the Senate and the House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled that any alien being a free white person who shall have resided within the limits and under the jurisdiction of the United States for the term of two years may be admitted to become a citizen thereof. There was no prejudice against immigrants. There was no anti-immigrant sentiment. Immigrants were defined by the law as white people, and they were welcomed with open arms because they were advancing colonialism. So this goes back to how the laws start defining who an immigrant is, and it's taken for granted from the start that an immigrant is a white person. Now, this changes after the Civil War. Until the Civil War, only white people can be citizens, and immigration is welcomed because white people are welcomed to increase the proportion of white people in the land. But the Civil War changes this because the Civil War and the ending of slavery, and let me just mention that had the United States not had a revolution in 1776, if had it remained a British colony, slavery would have been abolished well before it was because the British were already beginning to oppose and make plans to abolish slavery. In fact, that was yet another reason that the colonizers used to demand their independence in order to maintain the slave system. And once again, they went ahead and did that. The British abolished slavery in their colonies, in the Caribbean, in Canada, but the United States maintained slavery until the Civil War. Um, so after the Civil War, after the Emancipation Proclamation, after the ending of slavery in everywhere in the United States, Congress felt that it had to do something about the Afro-descended population in the country. One plan was to send them all back to Africa. And there were indeed projects advanced by none other than President Lincoln, colonization schemes to try to convince as many black people as possible to leave. However, citizenship was also opened to black people, and it was done so in two ways. 
One, through the creation of citizenship by birth. That is, for the first time, anybody born in the United States was automatically a citizen of the United States. Or maybe I should say almost everybody. The 14th Amendment, section one, begins with the word all. How many people here think they know what the word all means? <laughs> um, so it starts with the word all, as if they actually meant all, but they quickly qualify this word all. It says, all persons born or naturalized in the United States, then there's a, a subordinate clause, and subject to the jurisdiction thereof, are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. So, who is not subject to the jurisdiction of the United States? Who is in the United States but is not subject to the jurisdiction of the United States? Native Americans. Everybody is granted citizenship by birth except Native Americans by the 14th Amendment. So it's all, but there's a big exception to the all. Really, the all refers to white people and black people. And the, this becomes clear in the Naturalization Act reform of 1870, two years later, which says, and be it further enacted that the naturalization laws are hereby extended to aliens of African nativity and to persons of African descent. Now, how many persons do you think are trying to immigrate to the United States from Africa in 1870? You laugh, you're right, none. So this law is there on paper, but it does not apply to any actual immigrants, people from Africa who now have the right to naturalize, who now have the right to be immigrants, but who have no desire to come to the United States. Who is coming to the United States but is not covered by this naturalization law? We've already talked about them. 1870, where are immigrants coming from who are neither free white persons nor aliens of African nativity? Chinese and Mexicans, they are not covered by the new Naturalization Act. They cannot become citizens. Therefore, they are not immigrants. They cannot be immigrants. But there's a problem. If the Chinese come to the United States, they can't become citizens, but if they have babies in the United States, those babies are going to be citizens by birth. How can you maintain a racially exclusive country when you have this pesky citizenship by birth on the books? Well, the way you can do it is by restricting immigration. It's not until there's no need to restrict the entry of people by co of color as long as they are restricted from citizenship through the citizenship and naturalization laws. But once citizenship by birth opens this can of worms that anybody who is born in the US, regardless of their race, will be a citizen, is when Congress starts saying, hey, we can't let those people in at all because we can no longer exclude them from citizenship because they're gonna use this roundabout way of getting citizenship by birth and then we're no longer a white country. The very first Immigration Restriction Act is passed only five years after citizenship by birth is created. It's called the Page Act. And guess who it excludes? It excludes Chinese women, the ones who give birth, right? How do we stop Chinese people from having babies? We don't let women come in. But very shortly after, Congress realizes that that wasn't good enough because Chinese men are somehow managing to have children even without Chinese women. And they restrict the entry of all Chinese into the US in 1882. However, they are still greatly encouraging the immigration of Europeans 
to the United States. And I just want to mention two other pieces of legislation that are the very important counterpoint to the beginnings of immigration restriction and the rethinking of who can be a citizen, the problems created by citizenship by birth, which are the 1862 Homestead Act and the 1887 Dawes Act. Are those acts anybody here is familiar with? So the Homestead Act opens up, here we're coming to manifest destiny, opens up lands in the West to any white immigrant who wants land. That is, it's the encouragement of white immigration as a way of continuing the population replacement project now in the West after the middle of the 19th century, after the West is taken through the Mexican-American War. So the second one, 1887, the Dawes Act, breaks up the recently formed Indian reservations in the West and once again opens them to white settlement. So there's increasing promotion of white settlement happening just as restrictive immigration laws begin to be passed against non-white peoples, first the Chinese, then the Indians, the Japanese, it gets, goes on and on and on until finally in 1917, which is the height of Asian immigration restriction with the creation of what they call the Asiatic Barred Zone. The immigration restrictionists invent this thing called Asia they say everyone from Asia is neither black nor white, so therefore they are aliens ineligible to citizenship, and therefore to prevent them from gaining citizenship, we have to prevent them from entering the country at all. The Asiatic Barred Zone states, no alien ineligible to citizenship shall be admitted to the United States. And what about the other people who are immigrating to the United States at this time who are neither of African descent nor white? The Mexicans. They are treated completely differently by immigration law. And this is also really important to understand how the whole pattern works. Especially after Chinese and other Asians are excluded, Mexican labor is even more necessary in the Southwest, West and Southwest. So Mexicans, their immigration, their crossing the border is not restricted, but they are not considered immigrants. They're also racially ineligible to citizenship, but they are not admitted to the United States as immigrants. They are deportable workers from the very beginning. As soon as citizenship by birth is there, the idea is we need Mexicans to come and do the work. We do not want them to be citizens. They're easier to deport than the Chinese because it's right across the border. Mexicans become a permanently deportable labor force. So we could say by the 1924 Immigration Act, there are really three different sets of immigration laws in the United States based upon race. Asians completely excluded. White people promoted. Mexicans admitted but not as immigrants. Everybody follow this? So, this is my last slide. Uh, inviting and deporting, and I see I'm just, just approaching 45 minutes, so. Uh, inviting and deporting Mexicans. 1848, the Mexican-American War, or the War of the North American Invasion, as it's known in Mexico, when the United States, continuing its colonial project, continuing its colonizing project, takes 55% of Mexico's territory. Um, it's called the Mexican-American War. Mexico claimed this territory, but 
who was the majority of the population in the territory that was taken, which is basically the west and southwest of the United States? The majority of the population was Native American. They're left out of the name of the war, they're left out of the history of the war, and of course, they're left out of citizenship. Um, and this whole project of the Dawes Act and the Homestead Act is a settler colonial project of inviting white immigrants to take native land. Congress needs to decide where to draw the line. How much of Mexico are we going to take, they ask. And they say, well, we really don't want those Mexican people who they consider to be a mongrel race. Nobody could figure out what race the Mexicans were. Um, so they drew the line at the Rio Grande River basically to take as much of the resource-rich land as they could take with as few Mexican people as they could take. And if you look at the congressional debates, that's exactly what they are talking about. However, the need for Mexican labor on this new land is immediate. So recruitment of Mexican workers, both through private means and uh, in two different periods, from 1917 to 22 and from 1942 to 64, through government means, that is, the both the government and private enterprises are recruiting immigrants in Europe. Both the government and private enterprises are recruiting deportable workers in Mexico to come labor and be sent home. And this opportunistic use of Mexican labor, it's built into the guest worker programs where people are brought in under government auspices and deported at the end of their contract. Um, it's implemented in the 1930s with what is called repatriation of Mexicans during the Depression. That is, Mexicans were considered inherently not immigrants. Mexicanness is a permanent characteristic, unlike being Italian. If you're Italian, you can become American. If you're Mexican, you're going to be Mexican forever. Um, so repatriation, sending them back to their country. The second Bracero program and this constant system of importation and deportation, which continues until 1965 under US government auspices. 1965 is the Hart Seller Immigration Act, which is the Immigration Act that which we still live under today, which is generally uh, presented in textbooks as when we make a fair immigration system, when we treat everybody equally, when we open immigration to everyone in the world. That's how we're usually taught about the 1965 Act. Um, but what we aren't told is that the 1965 Act criminalizes Mexicans in a whole new way. That is, up until 1965, there were no restrictions on Mexicans crossing the border and coming into the United States. The restrictions were on citizenship. Mexicans would always be Mexicans, and so they could always be deported, especially before they could have children and let their children get citizenship by birth. 1965, and so I just give you some of the numbers here. Um, hundreds of thousands of Mexicans are crossing the border legally every year to work and then be deported back home, especially at the end of the harvest season. By now, the mid-20th century agricultural work is indeed the major work that Mexican migrants are doing. 1965 sets a quota on Mexican immigration for the first time ever, and that quota is 20,000 a year. The hundreds of thousands of Mexicans who've been crossing the border have suddenly been turned into criminals. They have suddenly been made illegal. So when I ask in the, or state in the title of my book, Undocumented, how immigration became illegal, I look to 1965 as a really key moment when Mexican migrants were turned into illegal people. And I think this criminalization served a very important purpose, which is that with the civil rights activism and civil rights legislation of the 1960s, 
It became indefensible to deport Mexicans, to discriminate against Mexicans just on racial grounds. The new immigration law creates a new rationale. Mexicans are being deported not because of their race, but because they're illegal. So I guess I'll just say one more thing because I'm still thinking about the carceral state and settler colonialism. I think that illegality, the carceral state, the deportation system are all very, very deeply tied into the settler colonial project. And when we look at this history, we see those connections. Okay, that's where I'll end. So 